Welcome down the rabbit hole, friends. It's time to jump fully into the Gypsy Rose Blanchard book, Released, Conversations on the Eve of Freedom. Again, it's super easy to obtain this book through Amazon. It's an ebook, so you read it on your Kindle or with an Amazon app. Um, it was very easy for me to get it. And we're going to dive right into chapter one. And we're going to see if we can get through this. It's only 100 pages long. The introduction was like kind of a big chunk of it. So let's get into this. I'm just as flawed um, as the next person. I've made mistakes in my life. I've made bad choices. But once the parole board knows the things that they don't know, it'll make them understand a little bit better who I am and why I did what I did. Chapter one, it's called Trust and Betrayal. It starts with Gypsy Rose Blanchard having a conversation with Melissa, who is the writer who's helping her write this ebook. The two of them are conversing back and forth and Gypsy Rose is incredibly excited because she just found out that she will be able to leave prison on the earliest date possible, which was in December of 2023. So she's really excited in this part of the conversation. Then Gypsy gets into talking about her trust issues, which started with her relationship with her mother. She writes... My main human interaction throughout my early childhood was with my mother. So much of her grooming happened when my brain was still developing, when you have nothing but unconditional trust of your parents. Grabbing the hand of her mother to cross a busy intersection, a child does not even think she might be flung in front of a bus. Okay, now <laughs> for me, from my point of view, I cannot reiterate enough this girl went through some of the most horrific abuse that I have seen when it comes to Munchausen by proxy cases. And many of the cases that I'm personally aware of have ended with the child, either when they were very young, being taken away from the parent, or unfortunately ended with the death of the child. Gypsy lets us know that her mother had convinced her that she had her best interests at heart. And she said she was even really good at convincing all the doctors, all the professionals we were around daily. They believed that she was a great mother, someone who really loved and cared for me. And I believed it too. She also emphasizes that she grew up pretty much alone with only her mother to count on, only her mother to trust. And she says that now it's caused a lot of issues with discernment for her, like um, trying to figure out the motivations of people around her is something that becomes quite difficult because, you know, as stated here, she was required to trust her mother in order to survive. She was the only person around, the very young and vulnerable and susceptible Gypsy Rose. She needed to accept what her mother said in order to just make it through life. She states she even had trouble in trusting her public defender, like her attorney at trial. Um, it was hard for her to really like divulge all of her secrets to him or anyone else around her. And then when she got into the prison, it was difficult to interact with the other inmates and know who to trust and not trust. Okay, now this part is really interesting. Gypsy Rose says that when she first got into the prison, she thought she made friends with someone. She felt very close to this person and decided to open up to them. Gypsy Rose says that she cried on the other inmate's shoulder. She thought that they were good friends. And then a few days later, her public defender came to her and let her know that that specific inmate had gone to her own attorney and wanted to trade Gypsy Rose like secrets, the secrets that were told to her when she was crying for a better plea deal. And the public defender had to spend a lot of time coaching Gypsy on the fact that, you know, she was going to encounter this time and time again, and she had to be very careful. And it's here that Gypsy talks about her grandfather, Claude, trigger warning for abuse and SA. I've heard an awful lot about Claude. I've actually had someone message me just letting me know that everything Gypsy says in this book seems to line up with her own interactions with Claude over the years. My name is Claude Petrie. Didi was my daughter, and Gypsy was my granddaughter. So let's take a listen to what Gypsy has to say about her grandfather. Gypsy writes, Well, my mother told me my grandfather had a wandering eye. 
my grandmother died in 1997 when I was young, around six years old, I think. My mom was pretty devastated. Soon after her death, like really soon, my grandfather dated a woman named Laura and made and married her. According to Laura, my mother put Roundup, a toxic chemical in her food. And what's really interesting is that my mother and Laura and my stepmother, Christy, were all nurses aides at the same hospital and they actually worked together. We talked about this in one of my earlier videos. Gypsy also writes, I didn't realize there were things in my life that weren't normal until I got to prison and worked through it all, like the baths I used to take with my mother right up until before the murder. After she divorced Rod, Didi moved back with us. And uh, at night, Gypsy had a machine on. The alarm would come on when she stopped breathing. Gypsy also states that during these baths with her mother, you know, when she was <laughs> well into her adulthood, her mother would also assist in shaving her vagina. And people around her have now let her know that that was also very inappropriate and not something that typical mother um, daughter relationships entail. Gypsy goes on to write, when I was at real age 19, my mother told me that her father had molested her. And I did have a memory from when I was five that I knew was odd. My grandfather drew a bath and made my mom and me bathe with him. My mother told me that when we lived with my grandfather and his wife for a bit after she had the car accident waiting for her leg to heal, that he would take her into other rooms and continue the molestation. When did you were in the hospital? I took care of Gypsy. I had a pretty close bond with my grandpa. Then one day, it just seemed to change. So that would mean that the molestation of Dee Dee continued into her own adulthood. And here she shows a picture of her mom after she was injured in a car accident that happened with her grandfather. And Gypsy writes, I took this photo of my mom with my digital camera about a month after the car accident in 2001. She was in the hospital for two months. Afterwards, she experienced chronic pain, which led her to be prescribed with pain meds, which led to my addiction to her opioids. So when I originally heard that, um, Gypsy was dealing with an opioid addiction. I assumed that it was because Dee Dee was giving her medication through her G-tube. But now it sounds like Gypsy is admitting that she was actually taking her mother's opioids and using them on a regular basis. It's here that Gypsy realizes that the essay her mother experienced as a child and an adult is likely what led Dee Dee to treat Gypsy so in such an inappropriate way, especially when it came to the shaving and constantly stating that she needed to make her clean. And many people who participate in behaviors of Munchausen by proxy have a history of SA in their childhood, so it fits and lines up with the diagnosis as well. This is one of their wedding photos. Wow, that's, that's a long time ago. You know, we were only dating three months when Dee Dee told me she was pregnant. I was 17 years old. Here, Gypsy talks about how her mother's feelings of um, betrayal continued on when Gypsy's own father asked for a divorce so quickly after the marriage originally took place. And I think she told me she was 21. She was actually 23. I felt that it was important to get married, but I woke up three months later on my 18th birthday and just kind of hit me like, you know, you're married here to a woman you're not in love with. Gypsy lets us know that throughout her life, Dee Dee portrayed her father Rod as a deadbeat that wanted nothing to do with Gypsy. And Gypsy has come to recognize now that that wasn't the case, that Rod did want a relationship with Gypsy. It sounds like Rod's line of work, um, which is as a fisherman down in the New Orleans area, kept him incredibly busy, especially when Gypsy was very young. So Didi, I'm sorry. I always try to be there as a father, but as a husband, I said, I, I don't feel that. She grabbed our marriage license, was in a frame and threw it on the ground. He wasn't around much and he trusted Dee Dee to tell him what was going on with Gypsy. I know that the most devastating failure to her was losing my father. 
My mother blamed me for them getting a divorce. He also had another family, unfortunately. So he was trying to provide for both families. My understanding of Dee Dee's situation is that she received $1,200 a month in child support for Gypsy, which Rod paid dutifully. Dee Dee convinced Rod that Gypsy was so sick, it wasn't really appropriate for him to take her or be alone with her, that she needed her mother. Gypsy says now she knows her father was sending her like letters and gifts and money her entire life, but Dee Dee always portrayed it like her father had no involvement and wasn't providing for them. Dee Dee told her things like when you're, when you were an infant, your father would come home really angry. And Gypsy writes this. My mother had told me all about the real Rod, like how this one time he came home drunk to me crying as an infant. He supposedly lifted me up by my neck and said, shut her up or I will. How he had wished for a baby boy instead. She told me once that if I had come out a boy, my dad would have stayed because I wasn't the son that he wanted. I'm like thinking in my mind, how are you blaming me for something that happened before I was born? And I heard all the time how my dad left my mother for another woman, her coworker, Christy, at the hospital. We talked about this earlier on in another video. I mean, <sighs> My understanding is that Dee Dee believed Rod was cheating on her with Christy um, all throughout her pregnancy and that the divorce took place very shortly after Gypsy was born. When Gypsy was born, she was a cute little baby, you know. Uh, she was tiny, but healthy and happy. She really looked like me. I thought, well, that's, you know, <laughs> that's my child. Gypsy writes that she did have trouble trusting her dad and Christy, her stepmom, at first. Like, it took some time because, once again, she had been told by Dee Dee repeatedly that he was abusive, he left her, he wanted nothing to do with her. Um, Gypsy even says that she was told her mother was calling Rod from the hospital, like, please come and see your daughter, why won't you come? Um, and he didn't want to have anything to do with her. And now we know that that wasn't true. Um, Dee Dee really put a block up between Rod and Gypsy, and Rod wasn't aware of a lot of what was going on with her. After Gypsy was born to make ends meet, I was going a lot working. So there wasn't much room for anybody else. And it's here that she shows like a really young picture of Christy and Rod, which is, which is so funny to me. I, I will definitely share it in the video. Gypsy admits that her mother, Dee Dee, did, did not only imprison her and confine her to a wheelchair, but she taught her things like how to shoplift from a very young age. And this is also where the wheelchair came in handy. Gypsy writes, when my mother pressed the wheelchair accessible button at the entrance of our local Walmart, it was as if a stage curtain lifted. Personas entered through the automatic door. Out in the world, Dee Dee the caretaker and Gypsy the special needs child were public figures. We were a familiar pair in our small Southern community of Springfield, Missouri. My mother handled the chair determinedly with the ease that comes with long practice and nobody suspected us. Gypsy goes on to talk about how she would, um, she had like a whole system for shoplifting in the Walmart for her mom, and she would hide a lot of the items in her wheelchair. Gypsy says they shoplifted so many items that they had an entire bedroom in their home that was just full of random items like CDs, <laughs> um, DVD players, that kind of stuff. Next, Gypsy speaks to Melissa about one of the first men she got involved with while she was still living with Dee Dee. She says that this guy was like significantly older and she trusted him way too much. And it's here that Gypsy first talks about Nicholas Godijan and what she calls like her love relationship with him. And she frames it like, I used to think that it was love, but now I understand that it was quite a toxic situation for both of them. 
She writes, I felt guilty for him being in prison because if he hadn't met me, he wouldn't have done what he did. Responsible. I couldn't get out of my head that he was looking at going to prison for the rest of his life. I didn't even realize I was faced with the same possible fate. It didn't dawn on me that I was as in deep trouble as he was. So many people have said that Gypsy assumed that Nick would take the heat for all of this because allegedly he was the person, and it was found in court to be true, he was the person who committed the actual murder of Dee Dee Blanchard. And many have criticized Gypsy's involvement by saying that this is also the way in which she completely used this man, always believing that she wouldn't be held responsible because she didn't wield the knife she handed to Nick. It's interesting in this part of the book that Gypsy makes us aware that at the beginning of being held in the county jail, she and Nick tried to hold on to their relationship and their love for one another. They would leave each other's secret letters. Um, they found ways to communicate and Gypsy really wanted to support him and stay in each other's lives. Like she kind of viewed this from my point of view, it sounds like a Romeo and Juliet type of situation. And she was still very enmeshed with him. But fast forward four years later into Gypsy Rose's sentence, and she had met and fallen in love with a man named Ken, who was her first fiance before she met Ryan. Gypsy ended up getting engaged to Ken and Nick found out about it. Gypsy lets us know that Nick was furious and wrote her a letter saying that he believed Gypsy was committing adultery. Gypsy writes, he had taken my virginity, which he didn't. So this is something she's going to talk about later. And by God's law, we were married, according to Nick. Gypsy writes, the letter that Nick sent, it was reminiscent of his dominant role, which he had obsessed with playing out when we were in our internet relationship. His attempt to control me and humiliate me as his submissive for his own deviant pleasure had gotten old. And she says that now she felt like she was in a healthy relationship with Ken and she could see that the relationship she had with Nick was toxic. So Gypsy wrote him a letter back and let him know, like, this is the end. This is the closure of our relationship. And Nick was very upset about this. Chapter two on family and friendship. In the beginning of this chapter, Gypsy talks about not being involved with her mother's family at all and not wanting to get involved with them. Dimitri and I am Gypsy's uncle, which uh, Didi was my younger sister. Didi was smart. She was the nurse's assistant, and she would look up the disease and kind of say, hey, maybe Gypsy does have that. Except for one cousin named Bobby, and I'm pretty sure that Bobby appeared in one of the documentaries, and basically he was the only one from Gypsy's side of the family who really came out in full support of Gypsy, and he was willing to potentially um, testify at the parole board in support of her to say, like, I know Gypsy's mom. Dee Dee was a bad person. She was always this way. Um, so, I mean, props to Bobby for being there for Gypsy. My name is Bobby Petrie. My cousin is Gypsy Rose Blanchard, and my aunt was Dee Dee Blanchard. Getting into the wheelchair was a graduation from like wrapping her knee with a bandage for a basic scrape to let's see how far I could take this. And Bobby was the only one on Dee Dee's side of the family to really talk to Gypsy and validate a lot of her um, experiences with Dee Dee. He flat out said, like, I always knew something was really wrong with Dee Dee. She always had so many problems. You're not alone in what you experienced or, you know, feeling the way that you felt about how your mom was. She was supposedly being taught by her mom the homeschooling, which was never the case. As a child, I would spend a lot of time with my grandpa. Now Gypsy's going to share some interesting information about her mom that I wasn't aware of. Apparently, Dee Dee was the youngest of six children. Dee Dee and Rod, they met at a bowling alley when Rod was only 17 years old and her mom was 24. <laughs> so she definitely kind of had an upper hand in being dominant in the relationship. And Dee Dee was a former beauty queen. Her parents had invested in allowing her to compete in beauty competitions throughout her childhood. 
In 1990, Rod accidentally got Dee Dee pregnant and they decided to go forward with getting married. On December 27th, like right after Christmas, 1990, Dee Dee and Rod tied the knot. Dee Dee's representation of that relationship to Gypsy was always, men will break your heart, so stay away from them. My mom would tell me, like, well, your dad's happy with Christy, and he's got a new baby girl, and he doesn't want to be with us. It's here that Gypsy recognizes that it's likely Dee Dee learned Munchausen by proxy-like behaviors from her own mother, Emma Petrie. Gypsy writes, my mother used to tell me stories of missing a lot of school because her mother said she was so sick and she would take her to the doctors. My mother did wind up with severe health issues like diabetes, which required her to take insulin. I don't know if the closeness they had allowed my mother to tell her mother what her dad was doing to her, but my mother did tell me that grandma used to call her own husband a man whore. Dee Dee built a family of just two, moving away from her own parents with Gypsy and, you know, participating in her own life where she could hold Gypsy prisoner. Dee Dee limited Gypsy's interactions with anyone. Even the schedule that Gypsy and Dee Dee lived on was quite odd. They didn't wake up until 11 a.m. every morning, and that was the time in which Dee Dee would give Gypsy her medications. Gypsy was fed through a feeding tube while Dee Dee ate like real food around her. Gypsy says for the rest of the day, they would always watch The Bold and the Beautiful, watch a movie, have dinner, watch another movie, and then start a nighttime routine. Gypsy writes, she'd bathe me, dress me, and put me into our bed. Technically, I had my own bed in my own bedroom, but ever since I could remember, I slept on the left side of my mother's bed. Next, she put on my breathing machine, which actually didn't help me breathe at all. Then she turned out the lights. But when Gypsy got a little bit older, she states that the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society gifted her with a laptop. And when her mother was knocked out by Ambien, she would search for information on that laptop about the outside world, what friends did together, what relationships looked like, and she developed quite an intense interest in boys. But when or if Dee Dee found out about what Gypsy was up to, Gypsy states that she would punish Gypsy severely. And it's here that Gypsy talks about not just physical and, emo and emotional abuse, but Gypsy also calls it supernatural abuse because she states that Dee Dee would perform odd rituals, stating that they were a punishment for Gypsy. Dee Dee would buy odd things at the store like raw cow's tongue and then cook it up on the stove, telling Gypsy, she was working on a spell to punish her. Gypsy believed that her mom had some kind of uh, supernatural power. Things would happen like a pencil would fall off of the table and Dee Dee would say, I did that with my mind. Gypsy says she never questioned the lifestyle or the things that her mother told her. It was all that she knew. Gypsy does let us know that she was involved in a couple of small groups. One of them was called Winners on Wheels, and it was a group for like several kids who were in wheelchairs. But one really sad aspect of this that she recalls is that she made like one close friend there. The two of them would chat, and that girl ended up becoming very interested in boys and talking about them in front of Gypsy. And Gypsy's mom completely cut off the relationship, stating to Gypsy that the girl was being inappropriate appropriate and gypsy states like if she ever met someone or like met a young girl like in the hospital anytime that that person got a little bit older Dee Dee would automatically cut off the relationship because she wanted gypsy to stay young in the next section gypsy talks about making friends in prison one of the people who she mentions extensively in the book is named millie and i do plan to do a short video about millie's case in the future it's quite interesting and it's somewhat similar to gypsy's situation um, and i have found it to be quite an interesting situation that should be reviewed Gypsy speaks about how like when she leaves prison, one of her major goals is to rekindle and work on the relationship she wants to have with her half siblings, um, Mia and Dylan. So a brother and a sister that are the children of Christy and Rod. 
I think it's here that Gypsy kind of says that she sort of looks up to Mia, who's her younger sister by 10 years, because she feels like Mia has experienced so much more out in the world that Gypsy doesn't really understand. So she looks forward um, to building that relationship once she gets home. All right, friends, so we're at the halfway point of this book. So hopefully we'll be able to finish it tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I hope you'll join me tomorrow as we head down another rabbit hole.